Hey everybody, Rick Casale here in the studio. It's kind of a cloudy day and I wanted to make a video about my planes head. You've seen some of these, um, these planes heads in, in uh, different studios over the years. There's a really famous one by uh, Farragasso. I don't know how old that one is, maybe from the 70s or 80s. And that one's been around for a while. And I think there's some good things about it. Um, however, I, I found as a portrait artist, it, it didn't quite have the proportional beauty that I wanted. So I, um, every workshop, I, I kind of make another one of these. So this one I, I ended up casting. And I'm gonna ship this one to, uh, to my colleagues in Minneapolis, um, Armando and Lois, they have an art school there, Pintura Studio, I think it's called. So what I, what I thought I'd do is make a video and just kind of explain some of these landmarks. Um, you know, there's not really lines between any plane in nature, but I think when you're teaching, it's okay to, to uh, you know, delineate a little bit more. So, Hope that shows up. So this side is my um, my more geometric side, although admittedly it's kind of organic in the way I've I've made it. Um, this is a this is a resin cast. Um, let's see, I I I asked four twenty five for these. It might seem a little high, but you know for me that's that's a number where it's worth my my while to make them and and uh, ship them. So so I think it does include free shipping to the to the USA, you know, the 48 states here. Um, but, you know, this is a resin, so it's hollow. I think I'm gonna switch to just plaster from now on, uh, just because just my resin guy wants to retire, and uh, I think plaster is more organic and more beautiful, ultimately. So what we have here is is a simple division between front and side. So the front of the face, call this the facade, if it's a house. And then the side plane really is delineated by this, this temporal ridge on a skull. So I've left the hair off on this, this case. And I would follow this, this temporal ridge down to the side of the, of the muzzle right here. Then you can swing it into the, into the chin I think that's classically what happens, especially with a male head that's a mature male head. Um, so this, this is the temporal ridge, it's a definite landmark. Um, this will represent the, um, the cheek form, but underneath that is the zygomatic major muscle. Okay, so it's roughly following that and the front of the jowl, the cheek, and then it's going to jog north here, or vertically, I should say, into the side of the triangular, triangularis muscle. Excuse me, triangularis. Okay, but you can see how on a, on a mature person or an overweight person who's young, they get a little more of a, of a frontal plane there. Okay. Now up here, this, this, this might be mysterious, this thing here. This is um, what I call the frontal quadrant, okay? And if you look at a skull, I forgot to go get my skull. I'll run and get it. If you look at a skull, you'll see this, um, see this here, this section here? I, I may have made it a little big. I think it tends to be smaller than that. But this is what I call the quadrant, and it's, it's delineated by, you know, it, it's demarcated by the two frontal eminences at the top. See, I'd made two X's there. And then here are the nasal eminences. There are these, these bird's wing shapes, sort of a whale tail of form. I mean, if you're a portrait artist, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and if you're a lay person too, you might, you might know that that's, you know, when you have a cold, you get a lot of pressure in there. That's, that's where your sinuses are. So if you combine frontal eminences and nasal eminences, you get this, this little quadrant here. And I would say that's the true front 
of any head right there, okay? I, I know like Vanderpool and, um, well, mainly Bridgman, he makes a big deal about this one, and that's fine. Um, but actually, I, years ago, I was at the Portrait Society of America conference, and um, look at that reflected light, isn't that amazing? Um, and I was talking to Tom Nash about that, and he said that he, he's, he's a portrait artist from Atlanta, and he said that at one point in his teaching, he put, he put real skulls inside plexiglass cubes, inside a box. And what he noticed was, is there was a big, a big void in the corners of these boxes. And what that told him was that the head, you can liken it to a box or a cube, but it's, it's really not, um, it's really not. You know, if you look at it, look at it like this, you see the turn, see this gradual turn here? So it's really like a high point in the middle of that I don't know what that landmark's called, but there is a high point in the middle of the quadrant, and the quadrant is the front of the head. This, this little sliver here, sometimes it's a little sliver, sometimes it's a big plane, but this is a little corner plane. That's a transition. So, th so this will be going off into a half tone if I turn him, you know, to the, to the um, sorry, it's hard to see. I have to turn this. This goes into a half tone, doesn't it? Okay, so, so we have temporalis, we have the central quadrant, and then we have a uh, zygomatic major cheek form going into triangularis, and then swinging into the chin. Over on the, on the dark side here, this is the masseter muscle. So I'll put an M there for, for uh, Armando and Lois. They're going to be teaching with this thing. Hope they don't mind that I'm sketching on it. It'll probably rub off. I'll put a T there for temporalis, temporal. And then this one here, this is one you may not think about too much. This is the, um, roughly, this is the zygomatic minor muscle, okay? So a lot of times you'll see, you know, sort of a, um, sort of a two hemispheres going through the head, you know, from this parietal eminence down through the cheekbones, through the ears, all the way to the upper lip. You kind of get everything below that line going into a smokier region, you know, going under. There's a beautiful drawing in, in the Vanderpool book. Of, I think it's of his daughter, Dorothy. Dorothy Vanderpool. Never learned much about her, but there's a nice drawing of her, and it's real nice and smoky as it goes under. So as a portrait artist, you want to know about that smoky southern hemisphere. Okay, the nose is relatively developed with uh, planes, with the nasal bone, triangular cartilage, alar cartilage. Uh, I think there's more in this than people might, might even realize. So I'll just kind of sketch that out. Um, and then the other side here, I hope it shows up. This is a little more organic explanation of, of uh of the planes, I'll get close so you can see it. Okay, so so over here, I've, I've delineated the front plane of the cheekbone. Okay, that's a special little shape there. Um, and that's definitely something you need to think about is, you know, what's the front of the zygomatic bone? Zygomatic arch, probably has a name there. Um, it's, not, it's not a straight, you know, it's angled to the corner, but regardless, it's a very important landmark. And then here, I have this cheek form coming off the nose. This creates the, uh, you know, the front of the laugh lines, people call it, these little accents here. Um, my teacher, Steve Perkins, always called this the Aquanazi form. And uh, I think it's fine to have any kind of name for it you want. But essentially, this is like a feather-shaped I don't know if it's feather shaped because it goes up onto the nose like that, but it's um, it's a unique little shape that you can figure out, and that's the cheek form. And then here we have a little series, a little bundle of forms. Here we have this is oops, sorry, I need to sharpen my charcoal. This is the the node. This is the node. Okay, see how high the node is? That's that fullness in the corner of the mouth. The node. And 
I used to think it was just the node and the Aquanazi, but actually there's a third form here that I've come to find out over the years. Might be, there might be more than three on some people, but basically there's three forms there. There's this, there's this, and there's this. And I don't even know if there's a name for that. I'm sure some, some plastic surgeon or artist came up with a name for it. Upper lip is more angular. Lower lip is usually bigger and a little more full, right? The front of the chin, we're looking for a sort of a roundish mm, pentagon plane there facing down, right? Uh, and then over here, you have to decide, you know, here's that temporal ridge again. You know, it doesn't, it's not like this stuff all goes away. It's, it's still there in the organic. But then here I, I've made a little more of a of an organic expression to the zygomatic arch, let's call it. See how that wraps around. This is the protector for the eye, the housing for the eye. And it's always a kind of a mystery how this stuff works together here. But I think you can break it down into planes if you if you analyze it in an academic way. So what I've done is you have front plane, a little top plane to the eye socket, the lower eye socket, little kind of a crescent moon shape. Sorry, I don't want to be in the frame here. I need a cameraman. Um, so here we got, you know, the puffy ball of the eye, the bag of the eye, the lids. You guys already know how to do that. But what a lot of people don't know is, is this... Um, kind of boomerang up plane, this trapezoidal front plane, and then this odd-shaped side plane to the, to the zygomatic. So this is the temporal, this is the zygomatic. Um, let's see, this, this masseter muscle, again, it will, it'll generally line up with this inside corner of the eye, this orbit here, if you just run a line up there. And then on the neck, let's see if I can get this neck in here. On the neck, I have expressed the um, sternocleidomastoid muscle coming down. Remember, it's it's two two origins, two two tendons at the bottom. One goes to the clavicle, the clavicular piece there. The other that you see a lot goes to the sternum. Hence, sterno. Clido, clavicle, and then mastoid refers to the, the mastoid process back here behind the, the ear. This is the uh, insertion point. So, so you know, I didn't I didn't make it like cut like a diamond, but but it's it's there if you look carefully, and if you also turn it in a certain light, you'll see there is uh, another muscle here. I don't want you to get this confused with with the trapezius in the back. Okay. I think this is the uh, levator scapulae and the, um, I forget the other one, scalenus. Or, I'll look it up for you. Or you look it up, or correct me in the comments. How's that? <laughs> I got to restudy my neck muscles. But there's, there's that extra one there, and the, the Goldfinger book's very good at showing that, that it's different. Okay, so that's, you know, the, head, the top of the head's like a dome most of the time, right? You could look at it as a gable roof with the, just think the water has to run off. Think about this chest plane as a big, just a big front plane, rhythmically flowing into the back of the head, really important. Flow the front of the neck to the bottom plane of the orbits, really important. You know, look for rhythms and connections. Okay, so, so I just wanted to give you that explanation. You also get a um, completed ear with the cartilage uh, the back of the head is a little soft, but um, you can generally see, see the planes that I've made here. This is the big pentagon plane of the, uh, I guess it's the parietal bones. And then down here, you get this more of an occipital zone down here with the, um, the nuchal ridge, which is where the trapezius is attaching to the back of the head. So you get a finished ear on this side. This ear 
a little more blocked in, but but it's you know it's pretty crisp nonetheless. Oh, and then I forgot this. There's a downward plane to this zygomatic, so I'm going to call this a Z Z1 and Z2 because there's always that underplane to the zygomatic arch, right? All right, so there's there's not one way to break it down. This is just um, this is just how I did it this time, and uh, I have a mold for this, so I, I can ship him to you. Just give me a, a couple weeks to get him cast and, and ready for you. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna send this to Armando and Lois all marked up. I hope they, they don't get mad at me. They can always wipe it off. All right, guys, uh, happy painting, happy sculpting. Just know you're not alone in this, but we, <laughs> we're all struggling with the same stuff, you know? Uh, there's days where you're, a lot of us work alone and it's like, you know, sometimes you feel like you go backwards. And sometimes, uh, well, really what's happening is you're just learning something new, right? So, so even, the, even the old masters, they didn't know they were old masters at the time. They just, they were just struggling like us. So I, I, it's always comforting to me to go to my my library. You know, if, if I'm frustrated, go to my library and start looking at look at the old masters. And I start to see, oh yeah, they uh, they were struggling with that that orbit too. You know, they <laughs> they were just studying it as best they could. That's all they could do. Um, so you're not alone. I think I think. Robert Henry I called it the brotherhood, that we're all part of this like brotherhood of artists, and I guess you could call it sisterhood or whatever. It's a community, and we don't always get together, but um, if, you're, if you're studying nature and the human form, you're, you're, part of the same team, you're part of the same group, I guess. I'm not really a group person, but I think that's true. I mean, if your goal is to imitate nature, if, if, if your goal is not to imitate nature, then you're not in the club and you're doing something else. All right, so take care. Have a restful Sunday. Peace out.